but we'll just run through these really quick, a little bit of background of uh, what this program is about. If you haven't heard of it, some of you may have, and uh, we'll go from there. So what is it? It's a tool and it was really designed for managing uh, list-based nets, originally um, the Ole Miss net and the Saturn uh, weekly net for the Salvation Army. And it can be used for any other type of directed net where someone is trying to keep track of who's checked in, who's not checked in, and so on and so forth. Um, it also can be an end user tool for managing your contacts when you've participated in those types of nets. And maybe you're working for awards on some particular uh, net or you're working on your work to all states um, and you've jumped into the triple h net or the 3905 cc or something to try to pick up some states that you're missing so it can it can manage a, uh, a contacts log for you it really isn't intended to be a general purpose uh, multi-tool functional log for every single contact you might ever do you know, and there are better tools for that, designed purposely for that purpose. Um, but uh, it's good for keeping track of what's going on in a particular net. Um, so essentially what you've got is what we call a live check-in list. Imagine you're sitting doing an Excel spreadsheet and you're typing on it, but other people can see what you're typing as you fill the list out. It's kind of along those lines. And uh, that list is controlled by one person that's typically the NCS, but it doesn't have to be. And we call that person the logger. They're keeping track of the list and managing the list. Um, you have a contacts database to keep track of who you have or have not worked. And it could be specific to that net, or it could be um, just in general, have I worked this state, have I worked this city, have I worked this particular station? We have something that, you know, this goes back to about the year 2000, 1999, 2000, when the type of messaging we're used to today, you know, texts and SMS messages on your iPhone or your Android are, you know, almost instantaneous. Well, we've got something that we call almost instant messaging because it has quite a bit of a lag. The history of that is that we really didn't have the horsepower or the technology to drive the types of messaging tools that we have today. And since we're really wanting people to focus on ham radio and not on software, uh, we've kind of resisted the uh, cry for people from people to uh, speed that up. It's on the list of things to do someday. And perhaps what we'll do is an integration with something like Discord that's designed for that real-time interaction rather than try to replicate it yourself. Um, we do have integration with the qrz.com XML service. So if you're running a list and you just type in a call sign, if you have a subscription, it can go out. To the other things, and those are on the, the wish list. But the most important thing here is we can import or export to the ADIF format. So if you need to move contacts to another logging program or to whatever you're gonna use them for, we have that capability. Uh, it's got a highly customizable user interface. You can move things around, you can change the width of the columns, you can change the fonts, you can change the color. It's pretty much um, similar to what you could do if you were making an Excel spreadsheet, you want it to be fancy. And we have a number of club related features, especially for the awards, uh, re um, awards oriented clubs where they want to keep track of well who's who's a member of military or who's got a uh, charter member number in our group or things like that uh, i'm not going to spend a lot of time in the screen this is just a quick snapshot of how my particular net logger screen would look um, we'll talk about this you can move stuff around on here this is just how i do it and i have a fairly large 27 inch monitor so i i tend to have too much on the screen at one time but the one thing I want to interject at this point is that this is a tool, but we don't want people to let it become a crutch. Uh, we've had a number of instances where, um, you know, someone's running a net and they have local internet problems. Well, the net grinds to a halt because they can't remember how to run a net <laughs> without, uh, 
you know, playing with the computer, like they used to do it for years on pencil and paper. So um, we, I just like to put that caution out there. You should be able to run your net without this tool, but it's great to be able to run it with it. A um, little bit the history here. This all started with a talented young fellow by the name of Chris Gerhardt, November 1 Hotel Whiskey, Quebec. And he wrote all the original code. For those of you that are uh, from the IT world, you might recognize some of this stuff. The, the client software for Windows XP was written in something called Borland C, which doesn't exist anymore that I know of. I don't think there's a computer on the planet that could still run it. And a very common uh, server-side language called Perl. The original users were OMIS, which is the OM International Sideband Society. And I mentioned Saturn, which was the, is the um, amateur radio wing of the Salvation Army's response system. And this all happened roughly 1999 to 2000. Um, the server side, uh, we operate a server that makes it all happen. And originally, Ole Miss and Saturn both funded their own hardware and servers to make this happen. Um, the netlogger.org has been crowdfunding a centralized uh, server for everybody used since about 2008. And Saturn uh, just recently, well, five years ago, got rid of trying to run their own server because the code on it was old and decrepit and it wasn't keeping pace. I rewrote the server-side software in about 2011. Um, on the client side, which is the part that runs on your local computer, um, Chris did his last release in 2007. And at that time, it's a young fella and they were starting a family and he just didn't have time to, excuse me, <clears throat> dedicate to it anymore. And that went on for about six years and there were numerous bugs, you know, the foremost of them being the program had no concept of daylight savings time for so for a, um, a few weeks every year after the government changed the start and end dates of daylight savings time, people had the wrong time on their computer and they had the wrong time in their logs and things were really a mess. But uh, that was all taken care of in 2013 when a talented programmer out of Colorado by the name of John Marvin, Alpha Charlie Zero Zulu Golf, uh, rewrote the client side using a development tool called QT, which is an open source development tool. And because he used that open source tool, we're actually able to roll out clients that run on Windows 8 and beyond, although I don't, don't know anyone's running Windows 8 anymore. Uh, Mac OS starting at 10.7, which is still fairly old in the tooth, and a number of Linux variants. Um, but all of those Linux variants require the AMD style chip or the, the Intel x86 clone chip. So things like the Raspberry Pi, which uses an AMR chip, currently not supported. Um, we formally got rid of support for anything running the oldest version on Windows XP in July 2019. You know, at that time, Windows XP was 17 or 18 year old, years old, and Microsoft had abandoned any support of it for at least five years. So I mentioned earlier, we got a number of significant users, OMS being one. 30 nano 5 cc being one, the YL system, uh, NADA, which is the North American Traffic and Awards Net, the Triple H Net, which is, that's a night owl net. If you're not up at three in the morning for the beginning of the net, you probably haven't been on that one very often. Um, and there are many, many more. So I'm gonna pause there, just see if anyone has any questions. If you do, unmute yourself and jump right in. Okay, nothing heard, we'll move right on. So how does it work? This is, I'm gonna go through this really fast because I really wanna to get to showing you the program in action. Um, we've got basically four components. We've got the server, which is sort of the central nervous system. We've got the clients, which sit out on your own hardware in your shack. We've got databases where we're keeping track of information. And then we've got our friend, the internet. Um, the server is a combination web and database server, and it's in a commercial.
software on that server is also volunteer donations of my time and the time of John Marvin and a couple other people. And we have dedicated hard hardware there. We have a little bit of a, um, what do you call it? I don't want to call it an endowment, but we have a little bit of a supply of money so that we're not in danger of, of you know, not being able to pay our uh, data center bill for any time in the, in the near future. So we're feeling pretty good about that. And our uptime has been really good on our hardware. Our data center sometimes has some problems. Um, and there was, a, there was a notable event back during the 2016 election. I don't remember which party it was, but one of the two major parties put up a, a website, happened to be co-located in the data center we were in in Boston. And one of these uh, online hacker groups decided to try to bring that website down. Well, they brought the, the internet connection to that entire facility down. You know, it was the equivalent of everybody getting in their car or trying to drive to the same place at the same time. So all the roads leading, leading to that uh, place were backed up. So the internet was backed up, but the hardware kept running along. Um, you know, here's just in a, a, a server kind of a view. You got stuff in the blue box running on the server. And you get a request from the client say, you know, give me a list of the nets that are currently in operation. And the server will look into the database and figure out what's currently happening and send the list back out. The client is a piece of software that is installed and executes on your local computer. It talks to the server over the internet when you're online participating in an active net. It maintains your contacts database locally. So if you want to have it backed up, you have to back it up locally. And as I mentioned earlier, we're supported on multiple operating systems. And you know the client's view of that is very similar, just a little bit different mix of components. And your, your client says to the server over the internet, give me that list that I was interested in. And the server thinks about it for a few seconds and sends it back out. Um, this is just a quick slide on databases. I won't even talk about that. Um, the internet, well, that's, that's the magic. That's the communications pathway between all those clients and the server. And that actually is the most vulnerable piece of the whole operation because every single participant has their own local internet connection, their own internet service provider, whoever that is locally. And being hams, we have all kinds of equipment in our shack in addition to our computer. We have amplifiers. And a lot, one of the common problems people have is they hook up their computer to their local network wirelessly using 2.4 or five gigahertz. And then they fire up their amp on 40 meters and flood the near field with about, you know, 500 to 1,000 watts and start bombarding a poor little wireless router that is used to receiving signals in the milliwatt range and crazy things can happen. So we tend to tell people, use wired connections whenever you can. Move all your network equipment as far from your near field as we can. And we understand people have limitations, but you know, simple things like that and maybe even getting down to the ferrite chokes can solve a lot of those those EMI, RFI type problems, because an unstable internet connection will make it look broken. And here's just a quick graphic. You know, I got my big powerful server up on the right-hand side and all my little clients connected. So I'm gonna unshare this screen and I'm gonna switch to the program itself. We're gonna do a quick demo here, hopefully. It's going to share everything I want it to. Uh, maybe not. So this is this is the program at idle state. I'm not doing anything. This is how it would look if I just fired up. And if I go up to this button on the other upper left here and say, select a net, I'm going to get a list of nets that are currently active. This is real time. This is live right now. And I'm going to pick. Well, first I'm gonna pick this Lake Agassiz radio club net just because I know what I'm gonna see when I say monitor that net. 
got just a few entries on a fairly short list. And um, I'm not sure. I hope you're seeing these other two windows that I've popped open. The one with the blue background is the little messaging window and there's nothing going on there right now. The one with the white background is the list of all the people that are connected via the internet. You know, and I see on my version only two entries, me and the person running the net. And they do have eight entries on the list, but most people are not running the program. So this is an instance where the net control station is running the list locally to help him keep track of who's checked in, whose turn it might be to talk and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's a, uh, looks like a, it's a UHF repeater net locally in, in that area. So people aren't worried too much about logging contacts or the things they're just probably having their club meeting for the week. I'm going to go ahead and close this particular net and pull one up that's going to have, I know it's going to have a lot more information in it. And you're going to see a lot of color here when I pull this up. This is the OMIS 40 meter SSB net. It happens every night. And hopefully someone will give me a nod um, that those other two windows on the outside have a whole bunch of information now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And if you keep an eye on the one with the blue background, you'll probably see that scroll up when somebody types a message. The one that has the teal and white lines on it, those are people that are running the program. If they're teal colored, they're actually on the list. If they're white colored, they're basically lurking in the background. Maybe their radio's you know, not functioning. Maybe they're just checking the list to see if the particular state they're looking for is there or not. So I'm gonna go back over to the to the other side and you see a number of colors here. These colors all mean something and the help files do a good job of explaining that. But the, the deep purple one, that's our net control. He's Rob, he's number one at the top. Um, the sort of lavender one, that indicates someone who has been granted privileges to write on the list in addition to the person who opened it. That's kind of a tricky thing because if you have people typing over each other, you can get some fairly weird results. But uh, if it's well practiced and you know they agreed on the division of labor, then there isn't usually too much of a problem. This sort of an orange color is a relay station. There's one here, line ten. It's kind of a light blue. You notice in the uh, third column there's a U, I mean unavailable. That usually means they said, "Hey, I'm going to step away for a second, or someone has tried to call them multiple times and they haven't heard them, so they've marked them unavailable. I'm going to scroll this a little bit and you can see that this list goes quite away. There's uh, 62 people currently checked in here and this line seven, this, they call it the pink line, but it's officially fuchsia. <laughs> That's the person whose turn it currently is. They should be making a call or, or waiting for a response on a call on this particular directed net. And when it's not their turn anymore, that pink line will move. And I'm going to show you something that I kind of alluded to earlier involving lookups in uh, QRZ. And I'm just going to choose randomly. I went down to a line that the net control station hasn't typed in yet. And I'm going to type in Dan in Wisconsin's call sign. Now, when I hit enter or tab, my local computer is going to go out to QRZ and look up information for Dan, and it'll display on the screen. Now, the other thing that's going to happen, though, since I am not in charge of this net, at some point, the list is going to refresh and anything I entered is going to go away. So that's sort of a, that's sort of a local function that's very um, transitory, I should say. It's temporary. If I, you know, I shouldn't have the ability to make something permanently stick on the list unless I've, I've been given that permission. Um, and I'm going to do one other thing here. I'm going to imagine, I'm going to pretend that I've just made a call with Dan and we exchange signal reports and I'm going to log that as a contact. Now, Dan is showing up down here in my log. It's the only entry there, so you can easily see it. 
But the other thing that happened is Dan has now turned red and this little W in the status column has appeared. That means, hey, you've worked Dan on this particular net and frequency before. So that's, and you can turn that off and on and you can have it change those colors under different situations. You know, I, I could have it change anytime Dan's call shows up or if it's only a certain band or if it's only a certain group that I'm participating in. And uh, the other thing I'm gonna do here is send a message off that everyone will see. And you know, this is our almost instant messaging. So it, it might take up to 20 seconds for the message that I just typed to show up because we don't, locally, we don't pull the server very often. And there you see it is showing up and it's kind of in a different color to indicate it was something I typed in case I was trying to remember if my message went through or not. And uh, we'll see if anyone responds or not. But you can scroll back through this list you can actually go back to the beginning of the net. We only usually show about the last 50 entries, but there's a way to download all of it if you want to see it. But you know, on a net like Ole Miss that runs for several hours, it could be 500 messages in here. So that's a lot to wade through. Um, that's kind of what you're seeing if you are participating in a net. And I'm going to go ahead and stop this one. Or actually, I'm going to pause again for questions. There's a question on the chat. Okay. Someone want to read it to me, please? I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to mess something up if I try to open it. Uh, when you type on that temporary call sign, the other viewers can see it on the, what are you typing on your screen? They can't see what I'm typing. Uh, they can only see what either, well, K7KKR has typed at this point. I typed on an unused line, and I thought it would have disappeared by now. It hasn't because they haven't got the list down that far yet. But if I were to go up, I'm going to go up to line 57. Oh, and I'm going to type something. I'm going to type my call sign there. But you see... Well, it wasn't there very long. I'm gonna do it again. All right, so I've... So I've changed line 57, hopefully you can see that. And in a few seconds here, because I'm in the area that the uh, person in charge of the net, you see it's already changed back to the original information. So I really can't control that part of the screen. Uh, what I type down here is not seen by anybody else. That answered the question, I hope. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna get out of this particular net because that shows sort of, you know, I was a participant. Now I'm gonna create a live demonstration net called the Rat Pack Demonstration Net. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm the net control. The frequency is visible light. <laughs> the mode is zoom and the band is the internet. I just made all that stuff up. And so I actually need to clear my screen because I don't want that to appear on uh, everybody's screen. And I don't know if anyone has the, the program loaded or not, but if I start typing stuff in here, control station and the logger stuff that I type in here does show up on the list of anybody who's uh, participating and I can do various things I can change these status codes I can change uh, award information I can add and subtract rows and do all kinds of stuff um, the 3905 century club has done a really good job of producing some videos in-house to show people you know, that are gonna work as a net control station, how this side of it works, as well as people who are just participating. Um, oh, AE5EI has joined our net. I don't know if that's somebody on the Rat Pack call or if that is uh, just someone who saw the net show up in the list of active nets. 
So we'll go ahead and add Joe to the list here. And I'm gonna do one other thing. I'm gonna open a new window here quickly so that I can show you that in our list of active nets now, line 16 here shows that rat pack demonstration net is currently available. I'm the, uh, I'm the net control and there's currently two people. That's the column on the far right. But before I confuse a bunch of people, I'm gonna go ahead and close that net down and go back to my idle state. Clears out my monitor list in the far right, kind of leaves the last bunch of messages on the screen here in case there was something I wanted to scroll back through to put into the, the notes for the net or whatnot. And you know, even though I'm running the list, I can do all those other things that I could do as a participant. I can log people. If someone makes a call with me and I want to put it in my log, you know, I can use that log contact button, put in signal reports. Yeah, I'll do that for Joe here. And it'll add him to my uh, add him to my log. And somewhere here, if I find it. There's a net name column. Yeah. It says I, I worked him on the Rat Pack demonstration net. Whereas the previous one I logged, I worked on the OMIS 40 meter SSB net. Uh, that is a very quick demonstration. Um, what I will tell you is you can't break this. Go ahead and play with it if you want to. You know, open a dummy net, you know, call, Give it a name so people realize it's not anything um, that they might be able to participate in. But if you want to play with the program, go ahead. Do you just want to install the program, fire it up, and watch the screen interact on some other net without checking in? You can do that too. There are no, no special rules here. Um, the other thing I wanted to show, I'm going to stop sharing this unless there are more questions about. Paul, I mean, uh, <laughs> okay, Barry, get my head together here. Are you watching the text thing for those kind of questions? I am. Oscar uh, wants to know what platform the NetLogger is available for. Windows version eight and beyond, Mac OS version 10.7 and beyond, Linux variations that run on an Intel style chip. So that would include Debian, uh, SUSE, Red Hat, and a bunch of, bunch of other Linux uh, variations, but not Raspberry Pi because that's a different chipset and it's not compiled for that. Okay, Dan WL7CO wants to know, can authorized users pull data from their groups? I'm gonna open up the chat since the chances of me screwing something up have gone down a little bit here and read the question to make sure I understand it. Pull data from their groups, well, like usage data, is that what they meant? Uh, yeah, and by the way, <laughs> I, I mistyped that message and thought I'd eliminated it. Okay. Um, so it, what, what format is the data stored in, first of all? And Perl can access any of the common online DBs. Okay, so the answer to your question is two parts. If you wanna see, data for, well, the answer is the same. You can see data for live nets in process. You can also see data for nets that occurred in the past. We have an API for that and the data comes to you in XML format. So you can do anything you want with it. Perfect. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase. We could record Aries nets for a section or a county and then have it available if 
the authorities that be ever came to their senses about uh, accepting useful formats for the mandatory monthly net reporting that less than half the right um, sections are using. Yeah, and there's actually another way you can get at it but that's a little less useful for your purpose. I'm going to do it here on the screen for you. I can go to this menu option saying, I want to see the information for a previous net. And I'm just going to, it'll give me the last 20 or so here. Oh, okay. I won't. And I won't. I'm just going to pull one up here. The Sequatchie County ACS net. I have no idea what we're going to see there. But this was the list at the time the net was closed. That was that was the list of their participants at the time the net was closed. So it's not as though a scribe has to do anything and it's only useful for real time when the net closed? Well, this is this is the past. This was when was it? <clears throat> this was a few hours ago today, but you can go back six months if you need to, if you needed to know who was on the Tuesday Aries net for March 17th, or that was a Thursday, actually. So March 15th. I suppose a better way to ask the question is, how does the data get into the net logger? Well, I can load it right here from the menu like I did. Right. OK, so there a, a real-time scribe mm -hmm. or the net control station can be entering right. check-ins as they happen. Right. OK, so how much room is it? Mm, yeah a lot i think uh <clears throat> i want to say eight thousand characters <laughs> if you wanted to type that much in this day um, and age that's not a lot but it will certainly do compared to no real reporting system at all sure i mean it's going to be <clears throat> it's going to be tough to deal with because at present you can't change the size of the cell like you can in Excel. So you, you know, you're going to be typing and it's just going to keep scrolling like this. So that, that could be a bit of a problem, but I understand the question. Okay. Very good. There are alternatives out there. And by the way, thank you for doing all this and then sharing it freely or for nominal cost to anyone who is willing to make use of it. Right. I had one other thing I wanted to share with you. And just I have to stop sharing this particular window because I want to share a different one. We are keeping track at a high level um, our usage. So hopefully you've got a screen now that shows my dashboard and this is internal this is not publicly available but i'm going to show it to you anyway just to get an idea of the type of stuff we're looking at you know here's there's the nets that are currently active um how many people are on them when they started what their lapse time is and then i've got some graphs here where i'm just keeping an eye on certain things you know how how many nets per day how many per the last four weeks how many in the last seven days um, unique loggers, that's people that are either running the net as the net control or running the net as the scribe. There currently are 871 unique call signs showing up having those capabilities between April 10th and today. And unique call signs, this is the Omar, Omar on the right of that second row now unique subscribers per day. This is unique call signs that we see during a given day, 24 hour period, regardless of what net they were on. You know, if I participate in the net for that day, I show up as a count of one. So we got about 5,000 people that have used the program one or more times in the last 30 days. And then I keep track of, you know, how, how people are downloading the software, how often and how our storage and things are doing. The last row is uh, some stuff we keep track of internally, you know, how much of the hardware that we're paying for we're using. And we're at about 15% yeah, utilization now. So we've got plenty of headroom 
to deal with um, growth. And I can't go back on this particular graph, but if I could, I would show you um, on this upper left, the daily nets last six months. If I could go back to March of 2020, and you all know what happened in March of 2020, um, the world kind of stopped temporarily operating as we knew it. Activity because they're stuck at home and they didn't have much else to do. And, you know, we were, we we're now seeing, you know, if I eyeball this probably somewhere in the 135, 140 nets per day average over the last six months, you know, and the weekends tend to be busier. That's why this is a sawtooth graph. That was closer to a hundred prior to March of 2020. And it went up and it stayed up. So that, I think that's good for amateur radio. Then I've got just a bunch of statistics and I keep track of uh, um, this here in yellow is a short net. That was me playing around. We, we don't count anything less than 15 minutes as actually having been a net. It's probably just someone doing some testing. And every once in a while, you'll see one on this list that's red and has a little skull and crossbones after it. Well, that's somebody who ran their net and then forgot to turn it off and got up and walked away from the computer and let it run till it times out. <laughs> That's not a big deal. We send them a little note saying, hey, this is what happened. And most people you know, do it once and it's never a problem. I don't know that anybody's have ever had chronic issues with that. And so there's a lot of stuff here. And we just are, I'm keeping an eye on things to make sure that the resource is available and that it's not overtaxed and that people are going to get good uh, performance. And by the way, the storm has passed me. The lights are still on. The house is still here. I didn't even hear much of a rumble or a rain. So I think it wasn't too bad. So I'm going to pause again here. I'm going to stop sharing. And pause Elizabeth again. wants to know what are assassinations? Assassinations, that's the person that left the net running. So we've got a little okay. we've got a little job that runs on the server and it says, okay, when's the last time anybody updated anything on this particular screen? You know, and by screen I mean the the, the screen that the, the scribe or the nest control person is keeping track of. And usually after about 45 minutes of nothing happening on that screen, we'll start a little timer. And then uh Eventually, we'll shut that down and send them an email. It doesn't really use a lot of resources, but it does just clutter up the list of active nets. People think, hey, the XYZ net is still running, and they click on it, and there's nobody home. Um, I will make mention that we have an extensive help menu system built in, lots of information in there. Some of it maybe isn't quite as clear as it could be. We have um, a support system where you can send questions or concerns to support at netlogger.org. We track them, we assign you a ticket number. We try to get them responded to in a timely fashion. And I would say most of the cases I deal with involve one of three things. One, they're having trouble installing the program, which is usually their antivirus software has done something to the download or doesn't like the program itself and won't let it execute. And one of the reasons that like a Norton or a Kapersky or a McAfee might mess with the download is we use open source libraries to build the program. Well, guess what? A lot of the nefarious software that the hackers build also uses the same open source libraries. And so they see that as a false positive and they say, well, we're going to err on the side of caution and we're not going to allow this software to be downloaded completely. And then the installation fails. So that's the number one problem. Number two problem we have is with people just 
not really understanding how the program itself works. And we usually refer them to the videos that are available out there in the help menus. Once in a while, we get real bugs and those get dealt with too. Uh, let's see, I'm looking to see if there's any more questions on here that we haven't answered. I don't see anything. And I believe, I'm gonna double check, go back to my slide deck, make sure there wasn't anything that I missed. Uh, that's, that's what I had. Okay. And I will remove the spotlight. I hope I did. Yep. And so anybody wants to talk, just to share the screen, there I am. Hi, everybody. Okay, uh, are there any, obviously, I don't see any hands up. Barry says the uh, chat's looking okay. Okay, we got a hand up. Uh, Hyder, go ahead. Got to unmute myself. I had a question um, since I walked in here late because I was washing dishes uh, from dinner. Uh, is this uh, program, if it was being used, uh, can it? Uh, can you upload it to uh, your QRZ log page? Uh, maybe I missed that part. At, at this point, you can do direct uploads to EQSL and Logbook of the World, but by doing an export to ADIF, you would be able to go to the uh, QRZ log page or what's the other one? Club log. That's another common one. And we've had requests, you know, for those additional built-in uploads and they're on the, they're on the development list. The other thing I will tell you is that the other thing that happened in March of, uh, 2020 when COVID hit is our lead developer got assigned. He works for Hewlett Packard out in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. He got assigned to a multi-year project that's, and he really can't tell me the details. It's a government contract of some sort, but it's dealing with the pandemic response. So his, his personal time to do enhancements or even fix a couple of nasty bugs that fortunately don't pop up that often. He just hasn't had the time to work on it, but he's going to retire soon. And then he will have time and we'll clean up some things. And hopefully we'll get at some of these things that make sense, like the ability to upload to a couple different additional online log systems. But right now the workaround is to use ADIF. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any more hands up? Any more questions in chat? How are we doing in chat there, Barry? We're doing good in chat. Super duper. Well, <laughs> I would say we have a, we've getting ready to wrap her up here and had a great, great uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Um, and I will put it out there if I know you've all come from a lot of different areas in the ham world. If your local club would be interested in hearing more about this, or if you just want to see if it works for your local club and you want to have a dialogue with me offline via email or whatever, happy to do that. And like I said early on, you can't break it. So don't be afraid to play around with it. The most that could happen is someone might come along and jump in your chat window and say, what the heck are you doing? Just ignore them. You got to be careful saying you can't break it. No, you can't. <laughs> oh boy, contest coming up. <laughs> I, I see it. I see it's a challenge by Dan. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I've, I've, I'm sworn not to do that. <laughs> okay, Oscar, you got your hand up. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Really interesting program. Do you haven't thought about it? Let's say you have a local net that there's no internet and you want to send the data to the server mm -hmm. and you want to send it to another station that can log the data and put it to the internet, getting out of the impact zone. Sure. You have uh, thought about that? Yeah, I think I understand you exactly. Well, the good news is if you're running in that, let's say you're 
you're out in the field and you're running a net, no internet available, no Wi-Fi hotspot, no nothing. You can still fire up the program. You can build the list. You won't get the internet lookups for name and whatnot, but you can build the list. You can save it locally on your computer so that you've got a saved copy of it. And then when you get back to civilization, you can reopen that list. You can open up an online net so that it ends up in the net logger servers. Or you can take that list and you can email it to somebody and then they can open it up in NetLogger. So th those capabilities are there. Um, you have to think through it a little bit logistically, but it should be easy to do. Okay, Oscar, does that take care of your question? Yeah, I'm, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, that it can be done several ways in sure. utilizing other software by email and attachment. The data file is not that big, depends on the number of uh, stations that you have. Let's say you have 20, 30 station and you get reports and you want to send that at the end of the net. Let's say you are in a hot zone and you had a, let's say twice a day. Well, Oscar, you froze up on us. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> it's your fault. So no, that, the idea is to get the and, and it can be done several ways, uh, even using welding, but it would be yeah. interesting if that could be hooked into a station outside the impact zone that it can log it. Again, all the, the purpose is to get the good information from the people who report it out of the, uh, out of the uh, right. If, if, if you've got radio contact, you know, you're in charge in the zone, running the net, you could easily have someone you know, stateside, let's say, because I know you're in Puerto Rico, you could have someone stateside in Florida or Alabama or whatnot, doing the list for you, even though you can't see it on the internet, um, they could do the list for you. And then people that had internet connectivity would be able to look at it real time and the data is going to get captured. So that's another possibility. Thank you. All right, anybody else start to wrap this up? been a great great presentation if you like to check in afterwards after i close the net out just come right back in like you got in the first place using the same procedure however you did it and and chat with the folks is in in the in the zoom meeting after after meeting meeting so to speak so with that in mind i'm going to say 73s everybody again john it, it's been a good one i was looking forward to it and you didn't let me down thank you very much Thank you all for thank you all for coming.